Hi everybody and welcome or welcome back to Murder at Bedtime. If you have been here before, you know by now, I think you're awesome. And if this is your first time, then I really hope I can persuade you to stay. This is a 15 to 20 minute, no frills, no waffle, no adverts, bedtime story. All the waffle is at the end, so you can switch me off then or continue to listen to me spouting a load of gobbledygook. I'd like to thank my YouTube subscriber, Teabag, for suggesting this case. It is a disturbing one, so please, if you are triggered by extreme violence, then give this one a miss. And with that, let's crack on with the story of the Blackout Ripper. In the space of five days in November 1942, as the German Luftwaffe relentlessly bombed the city of London, something just as deadly stalked the women of the city at night, when the blackout made everything so much darker. A monster who came to be known as the Blackout Ripper. Evelyn Hamilton was a very shy, anxious, 41-year-old chemist assistant. She wasn't married, and as far as we know, had never had a boyfriend. She had been working at Yardley's Chemists in Romford, Essex, but unfortunately the pharmacy was struggling and had to let Evelyn go. She was given four weeks severance money, £20, worth around £1,000 these days. It didn't take her long to get another position, however, even though it was up in the East Midlands of England in the town of Grimsby on the coast of Lincolnshire. On the morning of the 8th of February 1942, Evelyn travelled into London by train to stay in the Three Arts Club, a hostel she had stayed in before overnight, before getting an early train up to Grimsby the following morning. That evening, feeling hungry and the hostel's kitchen being closed, Around 10.15 she took a cab to a Lion's Corner house, one of only a few places in London in those days to be open 24 hours. She stayed about an hour, left the cafe, then was never seen alive again. At approximately 8.30 the next morning, electrician Harold Batchelor, on his way to work, saw a woman's leg sticking out of the doorway of an air raid shelter on Montague Place. She had been manually strangled. Although she hadn't been raped, she had been posed so as to humiliate her in death. It seemed with her dress hitched up over her waist and her underwear pulled down. The contents of her handbag were strewn around the shelter. 80 pounds, over 3,000 pounds a day, her life savings were missing, as was any identification. Evelyn Hamilton was identified by the landlady of the Three Arts Club three days later. Legendary pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury carried out the autopsy and believed the murderer to be left-handed. On Tuesday the 10th of February, two men from the electric company turned up at the flats at 153 Wardour Street to empty the coin meters. They were let in by Ivy Paul, who showed them to the flat of 34-year-old Evelyn Oakley. Evelyn was a married woman, her husband being a poultry farmer in Lancashire. She hadn't taken to being a farmer's wife, so moved back to London following her dream of being an actress. Unfortunately, Evelyn, using the alias Lita Ward, had not got the brakes and had ended up being a hostess at a nightclub and a sex worker. Unbeknown to her husband, who still caught the train to see her every few weeks. 
After knocking on the door and getting no answer, seeing it was ajar, the two electric men entered the flat. On pushing open the bedroom door, to their horror, they came upon the terrible sight of Evelyn with her head hanging over the bed. The floor and bed were soaked with blood. She had been manually strangled and had her throat cut. She had been sexually mutilated with, among other things, a tin opener and her curling tongs, and a torch had been left in source inserted into her. Once again, Spilsbury conducted the autopsy, and with the horrific injuries, the way she had been posed to humiliate her, and signs once again the murderer was left-handed, he was certain it was the same man. The police were sure he would strike again soon, and they were right. He did, and within 24 hours. This time, the unfortunate lady was 43-year-old widow Margaret Lowe, known locally as the Lady because of her refined manner. She too was a sex worker, mostly to pay for her 15-year-old daughter Barbara's private boarding school fees. A neighbour of Margaret's at Gosfield Street, Marlebone, saw her walking down the hallway to her flat with a client at around 1.15am. She later heard the client leaving the flat, whistling to himself. Margaret's body wasn't found until the afternoon of the 13th of February when Barbara came to visit her mother and found her door locked. With no answer to her knocking and the neighbour informing Barbara that a parcel had laid untouched outside Margaret's door for two days, Barbara alerted a policeman. He came and he found a key under the doormat and let himself in. The flat was very dark as the blackout curtains were still drawn and the electric meter had run out so there was no light. The bedroom door was locked so the policeman had to force it open. Inside was yet another horrific scene. On the blood soaked bed he found the body of Margaret strangled to death with a stocking. She had been terribly mutilated with an array of items including a razor blade, a knife and a poker. Her abdomen had been cut open and she had a terrible wound in her groin. She also had a six inch wax candle protruding from her body. Fingerprints on the candlestick being of a right hand once again confirmed to Spilbury that this was a left-handed man. On the evening of Friday the 13th of February, Henri Ioane arrived home from an overnight shift where he worked as a hotel manager to the flat he shared with his much younger wife, 32-year-old Doris, at Sussex Gardens, Bayswater. Finding the door locked and receiving no answer to his knocking, he fetched a policeman, PC William Payne, who managed to force his way into the flat and switch on the lights. To his horror, he discovered a dead and horribly mutilated Doris, naked on the bed apart from an open nightgown. A stocking was knotted around her neck and it seemed the killer had taken care and carefully carved one of her breasts, then frenziedly mutilated her genital area. It was found at the autopsy that a lot of the mutilations were committed while Doris was still alive, but probably and hopefully unconscious. Doris and Henri had once been affluent, but due to bad investments, Henri had lost his wealth and Doris occasionally worked as a sex worker to make some extra money so she could continue to live the life she had become accustomed to. Sadly, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
At the same time as Doris's body was being found on the 13th, another young lady was having a very lucky escape. 32-year-old married woman Margaret Haywood was sitting in a cafe at the Trocadero in Piccadilly waiting for her date, incidentally not her husband, when a handsome airman sat down next to her and started to try and charm her. He showed her £30, well over £1,000 today, when according to her statement she told the airman that she wasn't that kind of girl and was meeting her boyfriend. So what reason she gave for leaving the Trocadero with the man, I don't know, but she did. And the next thing she knew, she was being pulled into a dark shop doorway where he forcefully tried to kiss her. And with one hand in inside her skirt and the other went round her throat and throttled her into unconsciousness. But Friday the 13th was going to be Margaret's lucky day, as her saviour, a young night porter called John Shine, heard noises in the dark and shone a torch on the pair in the doorway. The airman took off into the night, but in his hurry he left behind his gas mask with the registration number 525987 on it. Luckily, John Shine deposited the victim and the gas mask at the nearest police station. It was soon being reported, however, that far from putting the assailant off, he now had his blood up and went searching for another victim. He came across Catherine Mulgali near Paddington Station and with his usual charm got her to take him back to her flat. But something didn't sit right with Catherine about this charming, handsome, respectful and polite airman. And stripping and laying down on the bed, she had decided to keep her boots on. This decision saved her life, as the man now changed persona completely. And as he laid on the top of her, his hands around her throat, she kicked him with everything she had in the shin so hard it knocked him off the bed. She made her escape, running into the hallway, shouting murder, murder. People opening their doors to see what was going on saw the airman running past them, throwing pound notes at Catherine and apologising profusely as he made his escape. But once again, in his haste, he had left something behind. This time it was his Royal Air Force webbing belt, also stamped with the number 525987. Luckily, while Scotland Yard were investigating Doris's death as another blackout ripper murder, a bright policeman at the station where the gas mask had been taken had tracked its owner down and 28-year-old married leading aircraftsman Gordon Cummins had been arrested at his barracks for sexual assault. As because of the number of these crimes at the time, he hadn't yet been linked to the killing spree. Up until the murders, Cummins had been unremarkable. Born in 1914 in York, when he left school, he had many jobs, not staying in any of them very long, until he joined the Royal Air Force in 1939. His superiors being very impressed with him as he rose from lowly ground crew to leading aircraftsman and recently passing his pilot's exam and was sent to central London for more training. In the whole, his colleagues liked him although thinking him pretentious on account that he claimed to be an illegitimate son of a British nobleman and called himself the Honourable Gordon Cummins. Now there is no doubt he was a handsome, charming man who had no trouble at all bedding a lot of ladies. 
even though he had a beautiful young wife at home. It wasn't long before Detective Chief Inspector Edward Greeno, on receiving the report on the attack and the gas mask, started to put two and two together and started to investigate Cummins, with the help of Detective Chief Superintendent Frederick Cheryl, known as the Fingerprint Man, they started to collect their evidence. Greeno blew away Cummins' alibi of being back in his billet by 10.30 every night. They also had his fingerprints on the candlestick and the tin opener. They found items belonging to the victims among his possessions and two of the pound notes that he threw at Catherine Mulcahy were traced back to two that he was given to him in his pay packet. He was charged with murder and at the end of the trial in April 1942 it took the jury just 35 minutes to find him guilty of murder. He displayed no emotion at the sentence when he was condemned to death. Gordon Cummins was hanged by Albert Pierpoint at Wandsworth Prison on the 25th of June 1942, ironically during an air raid. Now Cummins is also suspected of committing two other murders in October the previous year. The first was 19 year old Maple Churchyard who was found strangled in a bombed out house in Hampstead Road and four days later 48 year old Edith Humphrey who was found on her bed in her Regent's Park house. She had been badly bludgeoned around the head before having her throat cut. Now what started this unremarkable man on his vicious murder spree at 28 years old? When nothing is reported of him like this in his past or are there more we just don't know about yet? Well thank you so much for listening and as you know this is when all the sensible people turn me off and go to sleep and those of you left who I call the murder at bedtime masochists stay on and listen to me waffle. So, not too much waffle this time, but at the moment I'm completing my video of my search for the last witch killed in England, which turned out to be just up the road from me, about eight miles. This has been a very enjoyable project with lots of help from a lot of kind friendly people a story that I thought was interesting then sad and then made me very angry I also I went on a ghost hunt from 9 p.m. till 3 a.m. at the most haunted place in England the ancient Ram Inn at Wotton Under Edge in the Cotswold now anybody who knows me I am a massive wimp when it comes to ghosts and I can't believe that I got talked into even going though I couldn't record anything while I was there I took some pics and I will probably bring out a special episode on my experiences that night now myself and Lindsay have stolen from me, are still researching our folklore episodes, but it may be in the new year now as we are both really busy at work in the lead up to Christmas. Also, Debbie Q of the Right Shoe Podcast has a great new episode out about Randy Rhodes, the rock guitarist who died in a plane crash in the 1980s. So please give that a watch, it's really good. Anyway, that's nearly me done. Thank you so much for watching. And if you could please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this story. It really does help. And if you haven't subscribed, please do and ding the bell. And please, if you have a story like you'd like me to cover, please let me know. So any murder at bedtime masochists who are still here, thank you for staying up with me. Sleep well and night night. See you next time.